Hello, I'm Gary Ginsberg. I'm delighted to be joined in conversation by David Rubenstein, co-founder and co-chairman of the Carlyle Group, and the author of the best-selling book, How to Invest, Masters on the Craft. We're coming to you from the Robert H. Smith Auditorium at the New York Historical Society. David, thank you for joining me. My pleasure to be here. Thank you for doing this. You start the book, for the most part, with the same question. Probably two-thirds of the interviews start with the question of, did you think growing up that you would end up becoming a great investor. You grew up the son of a postman, Baltimore, Maryland. Did you think that one day you would grow up to become the co-chair and the co-founder of one of the world's greatest private equity firms? Of course not. Um, first of all, there were no private equity firms when I was okay, growing that's, up. That's and fair. There, there were no hedge funds, no private equity firms. Um, How no. about as fabulously successful and wealthy as you have become? Um, in those days, money didn't mean anything. My, my parents were blue collar workers. You didn't, we didn't have any money. We didn't think about money. I was more interested in government and politics. I had no interest in making money and uh, it just was not on my mind set in. When I went to college, most of my friends were not obsessed with making money. It just wasn't a, a, a common a thing as it is today where people now want to go to do startups, tech, tech startups or hedge funds or private equity or Goldman or Morgan Stanley. It just it was a different world. Yeah. So like a lot of really smart kids, you go to good college, you go to law school, but then somehow at the tender age of 28, I believe, you end up as a deputy assistant to President Carter. How, how did that happen? Um, like many things that happened in life, it was uh, fortuitous. Um, I had come to New York to practice law at Paul Weiss, in part because they had uh, people like Ted Sorensen, right. who had worked in the government, and I thought maybe some of his pixie dust would rub off of me, <laughs> yeah. and I could work in the White House like he did. Right. Um, I don't think he was that impressed with me, but ultimately, to get me out of the firm, he <laughs> he uh, helped me get an interview on Washington. I, I went to work for Birch Bayh, who was running for president in 76. Right. He dropped out about 30 days after I joined his operation. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> and so then I got a call out of the blue uh, from somebody who said, would you like to interview with another guy running for president? And I said, who is that? And they said, Jimmy Carter. I said, isn't that the peanut farmer from Georgia? They said, yeah. I said, he's not going to be president. So, but I... <laughs> Didn't have anything else to do, so I got an interview, I got the job. And then, you know, as we have observed, people who work in White House staffs often are people who are not the most highly qualified person for the job. They work in a campaign. So I worked in the campaign. My boss became the domestic policy advisor. Stu, and Stu Eisenstadt. Stuart Eisenstadt, and I became the deputy. Yeah. I, did, I had never even met Carter until about three weeks into the White House. <laughs> because I, he, was, he was campaigning for the general election when I joined him, and I was down in Atlanta. I'd never met him. Yeah. And then three weeks into the administration, I finally met him. Right. So... Um, you go back to the law after the White House, right? You go, you're, you're at Shaw Pittman for s some number of years. Right. When did you finally decide, you know what? I was, I was in the White House, I'm a lawyer, I don't really like it, I gotta do something else. Well, people used to come in the White House and say, you're a bright young man, if you ever want a job, call me. Of course, I said, I'm gonna be the senior domestic advisor in the second term, so why would I wanna call you? <laughs> um, anyway, what happened was, I, I started calling all the people who told me how great I was, and they didn't call back, and so, <laughs> Months went by and I couldn't get any law firm to hire me because I really only practiced law two years and I had the Carter imprimatur on me. Um, so I finally got a law firm that felt sorry enough for me. I got a job at Shaw Pittman. Right. And then I realized um, I, I didn't really like to practice law and I also, my clients realized I wasn't that good at it. <laughs> and so a combination of those things made me think, you know, you, I should do something different. So right. I decided to, to start something. And when I read that an entrepreneur starts his or her first business, if they're going to be an entrepreneur, between the age of 28 and 37 on average. And I was 37 when I read there that. There you go. Tailored. I said, I better start a right. company. I did. Right. So um, like a lot of people you, you interviewed in the book, there's this moment, this epiphany that kind of gets you on that track. You talk about an epiphany looking at a former Treasury secretary making a really big killing, I think flipping a greetings card company. Yes. Um, in the early days of buyouts, they were called leveraged buyouts. Later they became management buyouts and then they became private equity. Um, but leveraged buyouts were truly leveraged. In the early days of private equity or leveraged buyouts, the average equity component was between one and 5%. The famous RJR deal done in 1989 was 5% equity, 95% debt. Right. Um, Bill Simon did a deal in the early 80s where he put in 1% equity and they borrowed the, rain, the remaining purchase price I think they paid $234 million for Gibson greeting cards being sold by RCA. In a year and a half later, he sold it, and his $1 million investment became worth uh, about $80 million. So I read about that and said, hey, that's better than practicing law. The issue is, <laughs> you know, I didn't know exactly what a leverage buyout was. So yeah. I went down the street to, 
that Bill Miller, who'd been Secretary of the Treasury in the Carter years, yeah. said, your predecessor right. did this, why don't you do it? I'll right. do the legal work for you. You were part of Bill Miller's firm? Eventually, yeah. I, I did help him start it, but he said, when he started the firm, he said he didn't want to do uh, principal investing. He just wanted to do advisory stuff. Right. So, so I said, I'll do it myself. Well, it's amazing to me because you weren't a business school graduate. You right. weren't a mathematician like, you know, Jim Simon. You don't really probably even know how to read a balance sheet. And yet you have the confidence to go out and start this firm. Where'd you get this confidence? Well, most entrepreneurs, when they start something, they don't know how little they, they don't, don't know. know. Entrepreneurs tend not to be 75 years old. Yeah. They tend to be people in their 20s because they don't know how little they know right. or don't know. So, um, so I, had, I was young and basically I took a chance. Today, if I look back on it, I said, how stupid could I have been to think yeah. this was gonna work? Right. But um, you were smart though, right? Because you figured out, I shouldn't really run the firm from the get-go. I'm not gonna make the investment decisions. I'm gonna raise the money, right? right? So how do, you, how do you raise the money? Do you go in with humility or do you go in with total brashness like you know what you're doing? Well, I came up with an idea that uh, would help raise money. First, we raised money deal by deal, which yeah. we, each deal, deal by deal. But then um, eventually, like when you're raising money the first time, you go to your friends, your family, whatever you might know, and then you have a concentric circle and it expands. But I came up with this idea, and Everett Dirksen, a former senator from yeah. Illinois, famously said, when you're getting kicked out of town, <laughs> get out in front and pretend you're leading a parade. Now, what does that mean? Very that smart. means take advantage of the situation and find yourself. So I'm in Washington, yeah. D.C. So I said, we understand companies heavily affected by the federal government better than those guys in New York. Sounded good. Not sure it was true. Uh, but then I brought in a number of people who had been in the government at senior positions, like Jim Baker, Frank Carlucci. Right. So we had much more credibility right. to say we understood government. And so we focused on aerospace defense companies or other things heavily affected by the federal government. Yeah. So when you were hiring, not, not the Jim Bakers, but right. you know, the other levels, what were you looking for? Were you looking for high IQ, resilience, grit, um, total facility in what you wanted them to do on day one or more well, potential? Well, in the early days, I was trying to hire people and nobody was taking us seriously. But I was always, when I hired people, and I've hired thousands of people by now and also rejected thousands of people. I hired Glenn Youngkin. Uh, and yeah, I, right. I told him he's not going to make it in politics. He's now governor of Virginia. <laughs> I, told, I hired Jay Powell, and I said, Jay, why would you want to leave and go do something in the public sector? I, I think he's chairman of the Federal Reserve now. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I, basically what I'm looking for when I'm hiring people is uh, intelligence, but not a genius. A genius is hard to manage. Interesting. Uh, somebody who's a pretty hard worker, people that know how to communicate, know how to share the credit, know how to take the blame, uh, want to do this for the right reason, have some philanthropic orientation, they want to do something other than just make money. And they, they, they know how to um, get along with people, I think, in a, in a way that, that's useful. You know, what I, what I found so interesting about your interviewees was how so few of them actually thought uh, that they were going to go in and become investors, as I said earlier, and how really serendipity plays this huge role in them becoming who they became. And I'm thinking about Ron Barron for example, who is completely lost and he's selling fuller brushes door to door and he knocks on the door of some guy and they start talking about the fuller brush and at one point Ron Barron says, hey, how come you're not in Vietnam? And the guy says, well, because I'm a patent examiner and Ron Barron says, well, how do you become a patent examiner? And he says, you go to law school. Next thing that happens to Ron Barron is he's going to law school and going to law school sets him on this path to becoming one of the wealthiest, invest, most right, successful right. and wealthiest people in the country today. If you had to look at, back at your life, was there that pivot moment where it was maybe part luck, maybe part you know, predestined, but where you say, my God, if that hadn't happened, I would not be sitting in this chair tonight oh, talking sure. about my career. Well, if there were a number of people I met who helped me raise the initial money, had I not met them, right. um, I probably wouldn't have gotten the firm off the ground. And I would probably be doing what most people would have thought I would be doing, which is be a lawyer in Washington. When another administration comes into power, try to get another job at a senior, more senior level than the one I had. Do that for a couple of years. Go back and practice law, then go back in government. You know that kind of uh, bouncing back and forth is probably what I would have done. And most people who work in White House staffs don't go out and make a lot of money. In no. fact, there's only been one other person who actually I think made a, a fair amount of money going out of the White House staff. It rarely ha happens, and and it's just because you tend to. When you work in the White House, it's so seductive to stay in Washington right. because you 
You know right. people, people treat you well and so forth. And trying to build something either in Washington or outside of Washington is not what people generally do. Right. So um, let's go back to some of the, uh, the people who you interview in the book. So John Rogers said something that I found really fascinating. He said that one of his best tricks is to be greedy when others are fearful. Right. So uh, first of all, do you agree? And does that make this moment when there's so much volatility, so much fear, so much, frankly, like no one can quite figure out on any given day, is the market going to go up, going to go down? You know, is, is inflation receding? Is inflation worsening? So is this a good time for well, people to be investing? Well, John Rogers is sitting back there. Oh. And um, for those who don't know, John Rogers um, is a gra- he grew up in Chicago. His parents were graduates of the University of Chicago Law School. I think his mother was the first grad- female graduate of the University of Chicago Law School. And um, he went to Princeton yeah. and became captain of the basketball team. Yeah. I uh, came back to Chicago, worked at William Blair for two years, and then said, I'm ready to start my own investment company. Yeah, pretty cool. And for two years, he's 23 or four years old. And he started a company which is now, I think, the largest African-American-owned company, investment company in, in the United States, Ariel Capital, and he's yeah. done quite well. And his point was, when people are afraid of, of, of investing, that's when you should invest. And I would right. agree generally. Uh, the biggest mistake investors make is when the markets are going up, they say, I want to jump in. Right. And when the markets are going down, they say, I want to jump out. And that's generally the worst thing to do. So. Right. Well, you, you interviewed arguably the best grouping of investors in the world. Did your estimation of any single investor change well, I as think, a result? You know, when you interview, look, I've known many of these people for a long time. Um, you know, some of them will bowl you over with their intellect. Some of them will uh, really impress you with your investment acumen. But, you know, they're humans and they make mistakes and they're willing to talk about mistakes. So I would say... Um, you know, some of them are extraordinarily impressive people. Intellects are just staggering. Yeah. And, and other people got a little lucky. And like me, they weren't geniuses, but they got a little lucky. Yeah. Well, was there one that surprised you the most in terms of what he said versus what you expected him or her to say? Well, um, I just always remember the Stan Druckenmiller. Tell uh, me. Stan okay. Druckenmiller, for those who don't know, was a uh, person who went to Bowdoin College. I think he, wanted to, he wound up working at a bank in, in Pittsburgh. Um, he really, I think, wanted to work in the, in the forestry, but he wound up working in a bank uh, after he dropped out of a PhD program at the University of Michigan, and he started managing money, and then ultimately he's hired by George Soros, and then he came up with this idea of shorting the British pound when he thought the British pound would have to be devalued, and they made a fortune, which in those days was a billion-dollar profit, right. and he became you know, a legendarily famous investor. Yeah. Uh, he's a very smart person and done a spectacular job in a number of investment areas. So uh, applying it to your business, was there a moment like that where you said it, it's time to bet the farm? Um, probably not. Um, but I would say I was not, I'd like to say I was not the investment professional driving the investment process. Right. The way I divided the firm up, I had people who had MBAs and had been in finance before me. And I said, all right, what, in any, to be successful in any organization, to rise up, even if you're the founder, you have to add some value. So what am I going to do to add value? I'd say, okay, let me go out and raise the money. Nobody really wants to raise money. It was considered the lowest part of the totem pole. Yeah. You have to go around and ask people for money, and nobody really liked to do that. You schlep around the world. Um, but I said I would do that, and I ran around the world and begged for money for a long time. And, you know, when I, when I have people like Jim Baker or George Herbert Walker Bush sometimes showing up with me, that's helpful. But that helps, when it's yeah. myself, you know, you have, to, you have to know what you're talking about and, you know, have a good track record. My partners are producing a good track record. So if I gave you $100 billion right now, and I said 100, 100 billion. 100 billion. Yeah, that's even a big number for you, right? That's so, a lot of money. Right, and you could apportion it across the 23 right. investors. Other than giving the majority to John, who's here in this audience, right. how would you apportion it? I would say I would divide it into 23 parts. <laughs> it's too easy, come on. Uh, look, two of the lessons that I think people should take away from any investment book is don't put all your eggs in one basket. Okay. And don't put more money out that, that can be lost than you can afford to lose. The highest internal rate of return of anybody that I uh, interviewed was, in a sense, Warren Buffett. I didn't interview him for this book. I've previously interviewed him, but I dedicated the book in part to him because he has over 60 years had a 20% rate of return. So yeah. 20% rate of return for 60 years. Yeah. Um, for those who do not know Jim Simon, Jim Simon more or less invented quantitative investing. Quantitative investing means you're basically using mathematical algorithms to find market inefficiencies. And you go and, and fill those inefficiencies before somebody else uh, does it for you. And he was he's a, he's a math genius. He was a, a, a professor of math before and a really gifted mathematician. Yeah. And he built this business over 40 years. 
So in writing up the uh, summary of what he did, I wrote in that his uh, internal fund, called the Renaissance Medallion Fund, had averaged over 30 years 30% a year, and it scratched out 40%. <laughs> So he actually got out, it's averaged forty percent a year for thirty years in yeah. a row. I mean that's that's pretty impressive. Pretty imp incredible. So uh, you know I, I I think those are pretty good investors. Uh, yeah. But actually, when I was reading the Jim Simon chapter, it occurred to me that at some point are we going to get to the point where we don't need people investing anymore? That computers will essentially be able to find. Well, I mean, they do now, right? Well, for quantitative investing, which is basically what a number of firms do right. uh, with his fund, Renaissance and some others that are really good doing that, yeah, they have, they have really smart people programming the computers, but the computers are ultimately coming up with um, the algorithms. So I don't think you can eliminate humans uh, completely. In the business, the deals business, I think it's hard to eliminate uh, people because it's such a people-intensive business. From your book, it seems that two of the really big indicators of whether someone is going to grow up to become a great investor is come from a blue collar background and be a voracious reader. I think Would that's, you agree with that? I, those are some of the characteristics. For example, very few great investors have come from families that are worth a billion dollars or more. Because they're just, they're, they're not motivated well, to- Well, it's hard to have the drive. You drive. Know, you know, if you come from modest circumstances, you, you just have a certain drive. Now, obviously there are people from wealthy, very wealthy families who have done well in life, but as a general rule of thumb, investing is a intensive, time, very difficult profession, and you can't just use connections. You have to really know what you're doing. And I think if you come from a fabulously wealthy family and your parents are in the Forbes 400, you're probably not going to be driven enough to make more money to go into the Great Investment Hall of Fame. So it tends to come from blue collar families, I think, or lower middle class families. Yeah. And, and what about the reading? Well, great investors have an incredible appetite for learning more. They, they, they can't learn too much. So sure, they want to learn about their area that they're investing in, but they will read everything and anything because they like to absorb information. And when you absorb information, you never know a year from now, two years from now, that piece of information will help you in some investment thing. So yes, they're voracious readers. They also tend to be reasonably good at math too, yeah. but you don't have to be a math genius. Right. I'm not, Right. hardly. Um, Dawn Fitzpatrick told you that she runs every day to clear her mind. Dawn Fitzpatrick, for those who don't know, um, is a woman that went to Wharton undergrad, a uh, good Catholic family from uh, New England, and she wound up working at a, in ultimately UBS and became, in effect, the chief investment officer at UBS. But then George Soros hired her way. Right. George Soros has a history of hiring lots of people to run his money and getting rid of them in, after a year or two or three. So he's had a lot of people do it. She's been there for quite a while, done a terrific job for him, and she's a runner. And yeah. she's very thin. She runs two or three, four miles every single day, and that's how she relaxes. Well, I have a lot more questions, but I, we have okay. a bunch of questions from the audience. Right. Uh, the first question is, how will diversity contribute to the next generation of investors, and what can we do to distribute the opportunity? Well, um, I tried very hard to not have all white males in this book. Um, it's easy to fill a book like this with a whole bunch of white males, and I try to reflect what I think has been going on in the investment world, which is there has been increased diversity, and, and, yeah. and women increasingly are... are are in getting in important investment positions and, and other diverse uh, backgrounds are very, much more important than they were 20, 30 years ago. But I think uh, the fact that business schools now are 50% female by and large in terms of their attendance and large diversity populations in those schools probably means in 10, 20 years from now, you'll see a, a much different uh, subset of people who are running hedge funds or private equity funds than you, see, you, do, you do today. Well, on the subject of diversity, we haven't really talked about ESG investing. Um, Larry Fink, right. you know, has kind of taken the lead in convincing CEOs, the Business right. Roundtable, in fact, you know, right. embraced his idea that there's more to, a, to being a CEO than right. simply shareholder return. Well, Do you agree that- There's a backlash against that in some there, circles now. For right. those who aren't investment professionals, ESG stands for Environmental Social Governance. And the theory of investing has always been you should- figure out whatever you're going to invest in, how to maximize the profits, get the highest rate of return you can legally get, uh, and, and that's what you should do. That's your obligation to your investors or your shareholders. ESG means that you should not obsess over the highest rate of return. You should make sure you're not destroying the environment. You have reasonable diversity, equity, and inclusion. You are doing things in appropriate governance manner. And even if the rate of return would go down, it's still better for society. Now, ESG proponents would say, actually, the rate of return will be better because the world is moving in that direction. There's been a, uh, a little bit of a backlash recently against uh, ESG proponents, 
and some of them may be, um, I wouldn't say backing down, but some of them are, are being crowded out in terms of the public voice by people who are saying ESG is really uh, not helping the investment world. I, I think ESG is an important criteria. My own firm, Carlisle, is a leader in that area, and we're very proud to be. Did, did you happen to read the book, The Man Who Broke Capitalism, by David Gellis, about Jack Welch? I haven't read the book. I am familiar with it, though. So the theory was that Jack Welch, by having just this maniacal focus on just driving shareholder return, destroyed capitalism. Um, and that CEOs today are, you know, are much more enlightened. You talk about finding that balance. Right. Where do you think that, that balance resides? Should it be tied um, to the business, the product? Where I knew Jack lie? Welsh reasonably well. Um, and I would say, uh, I don't think he destroyed capitalism. Uh, capitalism still stills around doing OK. Uh, the criticism of him was that he was obsessed with uh, earnings per share and each quarter having higher earnings per share. And sometimes you had to manage the earnings in ways that maybe you can't do today. Um, but I think he had some good ideas. I think um, I don't think CEOs today um, do or should do what they used to do. It used to be you have an obligation to one set of people, and that's your shareholders. If you're running a publicly traded company. Milton Friedman was a big believer in that. Right. You 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 basically you work for your shareholders. Now the the point of view, which I agree with, is if you're running a publicly traded company, you work for your shareholders, but you also work for your employees, uh, your suppliers. The your customers and also your community, right? And so you can't ignore one for the uh, and just just basically say forget everybody who's a customer or employee. We only care about the, the rate of return for the shareholders. So I think it was a mistake and is a mistake to focus only on their shareholders. But you think there's going to be some balance between those two things, poles? Look, whenever a new movement comes along, it moves forward quickly, and then there's always some uh, right. pushback, and then there's a balance in between. Yeah. I think we're getting to a reasonable balance. I think it's unlikely uh, we will have a. Um, a, a complete agreement on this. But one of the things that you should realize is that, for example, in investments, you have a P-E ratio. And that's a good way to measure the value of a stock and whether it's doing well and fairly traded. We don't have an equivalent measure for ESG. In other words, you can't put a single number behind right. a company's ESG performance. Eventually, we'll have that. And so each company will have a grade, a number or a ratio. And you can say whether they're doing well on ESG yeah. or factors, but we don't have right. that yet. Right. What do you think about investing in China today? Well, Carlisle has been a very large investor in China, and I've been a big proponent of investing there over years. Clearly, it's more challenging than it used to be because the environment is not growing quite as quickly, and the, the push against technology companies and has been significant in the companies that are Chinese-based. But also, uh, it's harder for Americans to invest in certain types of companies in China than it used to be. So it's, it's a place where you have to really know what you're doing, have people on the ground, and be there for a long term. If you're in there for just a couple months or a year or so, you're probably going to be disappointed. You have to be there for quite a long time, I think, to realize the profits. But China is a country that grew for 30 years in a row at 10% a year. Now it's probably going at 2 or 3%. And it's, but it's got 1.4 billion people and 1.4 billion customers. So I wouldn't diminish uh, China's appeal as an investor. It's just probably not as appealing as it was a few years back. A question from the audience. What advice would you give to someone starting to invest? And let me, let me okay. sharpen that question a little bit. What would you say to somebody who says, I want to start investing, but I don't want to use a professional? Um, what I say, if you want to do deals yourself or do deals or buy stocks, you know, know what you're doing, really read up and be pre prepared to really um, lose some money from time to time as you learn. For the average person who has a m modest amount of money relatively to the disposable income, the best thing to do is not try to be a professional investor, but to basically buy an index fund in fixed income or index fund in stocks. The fees are low and you'll be with the market. If trying to beat the market is very, very difficult for professionals. For the average person who's a doctor or a dentist trying to, you know, pick a stock while they're filling a tooth or something, it's probably not a good idea. So, uh, <laughs> but I do, one point I want to make about uh, investing, I think that investing can be seen as a greedy uh, in activity. You're trying to make money and just make money for wealthy people or wealthy corporations or shareholders. The truth is, that if you are really good at this, you allocate capital in ways that help society. So for example, um, there's a firm in uh, Boston, a flagship ventures, which is investing in biotech. They stayed with a venture, uh, a, one of their investment companies for 10 years. It wasn't really producing anything, but they thought it was a good idea that, that they should pursue it because this idea was they had some creativity in the uh, company. The company was called Moderna. Mm -hmm. And they stayed with hmm. them for 10 years. And then Moderna came up with a vaccine that I think probably saved a lot of our lives, if not our health. And so I think if you're really good at investing, you should take pride in that you're allocating capital in ways that can help your country and create jobs and, and so forth. 
And so I think it's a profession that people should look at as being just a greedy bunch of people trying to make more money. They're actually doing something useful for society if they know what they're doing. Yeah, well, I, I think that you, more than anybody in the entire investing world, has, has found that larger purpose in life through your philanthropy. And I really I just have enormous respect for mm -hmm. what you have done in so many different places in this country and in this world by giving back. Do you lose respect for fellow billionaires who aren't philanthropic, who don't share that same altruism that you clearly you um, know, I don't have deep in your I don't put myself on that pedestal. I would say there are many people who um, do things anonymously. I don't really know what everybody's doing. In the end, um, what are you going to do with the money? Uh, you can you, you, you have a lot of money. What, you can only do four things. You can build a pyramid to yourself what the ancient <laughs> pharaohs did. So that's probably not a good use for the money. So yeah. you can do what most people in the, in the history of the world have done with their money, which is leave it to their children. Yeah. Um, if you've got billions of dollars to leave to your children, you know, is that going to make your child a better person to have inherit billions of dollars? And you know, is that going to make them driven to really do something useful? I'm not sure it does. So then I think what you should do is say you're going to give it away. And you give it away while you're alive or while you're dead. Yeah. And my general view is that it's amazing how many people leave the bulk of their estate to the point where it's given away after they're gone, as if they know where they're going to be, they're going to be able to right. see it or something. I'm not sure I'm going to see what my executor is going to do with my estate. So I want to give away the bulk of it while I'm alive. And generally, I think it's, it's a selfishness too. In my theory is if you, if you help other people with your time, your energy, your ideas, and your money, um, you'll feel happier about yourself. And if you feel better about yourself, you'll live longer. Happy people yeah. live longer than grumpy right, people. Right, so right. I also think there's a special place in heaven reserved for people <laughs> that uh, give away their money. And you know, people might laugh at that, but why would you take a chance that I'm wrong? I could Absolutely. be right. Absolutely. <laughs> so who knows? <laughs> I want to thank you for well, thank really, you for reading really, the book. Um, I, I read it and loved it. I, thank you for being, uh, you know, such a great. Well, interview. thank you very much. I appreciate your taking the time to read it, and <laughs> I appreciate everybody coming. And, uh, you know, I enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, you too.